In 1997, Robert Vince, a man with far too much power, produced a movie based on a dog that could shoot hoops. He then went on to create and direct four more movies based on this particular dog. After that, he made seven more films based on this dog's puppies. As its founder and CEO, and perhaps lone employee, this individual runs the curtains behind Airbud Entertainment. In 2020, some dumb punk uploaded a video overanalyzing Chef Skinner from the totally obscure French foreign art film cinematic masterpiece known as Ratatouille, which somehow amassed over 1,100 views, which is approximately 1,080 more views than they were expecting. Now, these two forces will collide. There will only be one survivor. My name is Rory Sorrel. I have watched every single Air Buddies film, and I'm here to tell my Rory. I, I, I mean, I mean, story. I have never watched any of the Air Bud movies before. I have somehow avoided all of them during my over two decades of being alive. I have, however, seen the entirety of the Air Buddies spin off series of movies. The power creep, the raising of stakes, and the variance in production value between each film is amazing. I can unironically say that these movies genuinely, for lack of better words, amaze me. They are definitely something I would call fascinating. I recently got to experience the joy of watching all of the movies for a second time. Air Buddies was the first movie I decided to watch on my brand new 4K 50 inch TV. In fact, it's the first movie I've ever watched in 4K outside of a movie theater. It was a surreal cinematic experience. I'm going to dedicate the first chunk of this video toward recounting the plot of each movie. Even if you have seen these movies before, I recommend you stick around for this. But if you want to skip ahead further in the video, I'll have chapter markers and timestamps ready down below. After we get the plots of these movies fresh in our memories, I'm going to discuss the production of them, talk about interesting findings on their development, take a small peek into the Air Buddies iceberg, and give my final thoughts on all of these wacky buddies. Let's begin with the first film in the series, Air Buddies. Air Buddies is the first movie in the Buddies film franchise and released in 2006 as a direct-to-video title. It's a relatively normal average talking dog film. In fact, it's the first movie in the Airbud franchise where animals can talk. Prior to Air Buddies, animal speaking was seemingly forbidden in the Airbud universe. Compared to the rest of the series, there's nothing all that weird at first. It's a pretty standard movie opening. It would probably mean a bit more to me if I had watched the previous five Airbud movies before this. The Buddies have this babysitter character. She has, um, a pretty unfortunate sounding name. I would rather not say it out loud. If you really, really, really want to know what it is, you can go ahead and look it up. Thankfully, she doesn't really appear after the opening act, but I just can't watch this opening without wincing every single time I hear that. They could have chose pretty much every other name in existence. Anyway, the Buddies basically make life a living heck for Mrs. Unfortunate Name, and this results in the Airbud family, the Sullivans, who appeared in previous Airbud movies, realizing that they need to put the puppies up for adoption. Our five canine stars are the following. Rosebud! Rosebud is the only girl on the team, as you can tell from the pink bow she wears, and the fact she dons a pink spacesuit and space buddies. Her personality is being a girl. Her interests are being a girl, and she is a girl, in case you didn't know. Girl power. Girl's room. A girl's car. Girl power. A girl needs her beauty sleep. She's also apparently my assigned Air Buddy Sona, according to BuzzFeeds. We know which puppy from Air Buddies you are most like, Quiz. Buddha! As the name suggests, Buddha is that white guy you run into at the Hell Food store while looking for that one product not sold anywhere else in town. That guy who pats you on the shoulder and says namaste before cutting in front of you in line. Namaste. He wears a Buddha's collar made out of beads. Butterball! Butterball is an evil, heinous, crooked dog obsessed with flatulence. He is the chubbiest of the buddies and has those black marks under his eyes that football players like to wear. He often talks about food. Mm. 
donuts. Andy apparently predicted The Simpsons being purchased by Disney. The entire franchise has a running gag that appears multiple times in almost every movie where he, um, well, he, he, uh, uh, it's this. Don't blow this <laughs> Oops. I never thought I'd see this, but let it rip. <laughs> Don't blow this <laughs> This character really, really tests my patience. He is the most powerful buddy and has at least one tally on his death count. Mudbud! Mudbud, not to be confused with Muddy Buddies, is a lovable, dirt loving, gross little gremlin dog that loves mud and enjoys being dirty. He can usually be distinguished by the blue handkerchief around his neck. <laughs> B Dog! Supreme, as great as I seem, at a theater near you, I'm living the dream. I'm a bad dawn, suckers be gone, I'm snatching the paper before it hits the lawn. Check this out, same when I take the court. It's so war, not a sport, if you're playing B-Dog, you're coming up short. Oh, and I can also act, word straight up, it's a fact. If you believe I was scared, yo dog, you whacked. <laughs> It's great to be me. It's easy to see. I'm the ultimate hip hop P.U.P. That's it. Yep. That's the character. The fact that two out of five of these dogs are culturally appropriating stuff here is a pretty good reflection of the series as a whole. So the gist of the plot of the first movie is that the Sullivans find loving and fitting homes for each buddy, as some evil Guy Fury looking exotic animal collecting guy in an eye patch talks about how he wants to kidnap Airbud for some rich kid so he can make money off of him. He sends his minions, his dim-witted comic relief nephews, after Airbud. One of the nephews looks kind of like John Goodman fused with Alex Jones. Anyway, eye patch man named Selkirk Tander isn't content with just Airbud after discovering that there's an entire collection of Airbud babies he can collect become even richer. He then sends his nephews to go after the Air Buddies, with Tander threatening to feed them to his creepy exotic animal collector's tiger, as the Air Buddies themselves traverse their local town looking to save their parents, who are being held captive at a place called Wine County. The buddies outwit the dumb duo to drive in movie theater showing of 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> I don't remember this part. Giant puppies attack Cruella de Vil? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Go giant puppies! A generic field. Come on! They're gaining us! Yeah. A barn with other talking animals, including a goat voiced by Wallace Shawn. Who goes there? And more. Meanwhile, the Sullivan kid and his best friend, who is apparently Airbud's wife's owner, are seen being sad about missing all their dogs. Around this time, this movie has a million cuts. There's this part in the middle where every other 30 seconds, it changes locations and what character it's focusing on. It makes everything feel like it's advancing at a rocket pace, but a lot of these scenes just ultimately feel kind of stitched together and pointless. There is some cute stuff though. Like, the buddies are mostly terrible gremlin stereotypes, but they still have cute voices, and there's some moments like the one where they're pretending to be pigs and coating themselves in mud. That's actually a bit cute. There's this orchestral score that plays at some points in the movie that sounds like they ripped it directly from Toy Story's score. I know there's such a thing as a motif, but it plays excessively, like much, much more than it really needs to. To a point of where it gets really hammered in and a bit annoying. Popcorn! Great start to our day. Oh. <laughs> Say it's all about the bling bling. You know, always meditating. Anyway, the buddies meet some friendly wolf after having a brief sudden flash of drama, and he takes them all to Wine County, while the human children run into an old dog named Sniffer, who eventually leads them to all the places the buddies have been. 
Airbud and his wife escape their containment by digging a hole which the buddies soon after end up sliding down, trapping themselves and getting abducted by Tander and the spoiled kid he's trying to please. The buddies almost immediately escape thanks to the two human kids, and they end up in a wine cellar where they proceed to get drunk. There is something so, so, so prominently strange about seeing a scene in this kid's movie where a bunch of baby puppies are swimming around in wine and getting intoxicated. That's the weirdest discreet juice ever! <laughs> Butterball, um, he uh... He, uh, he farts in the wine. Anywho, moments later, there is a quick resolution where everyone reunites, and the buddies all go to their new homes. Butterball even gets adopted by the villain kid because it's the right thing to do, I guess. There's a happy ending montage during which Mudbud completely ruins some kid's Nintendo Game Boy. One genuinely sweet thing about this movie is that it ends with a dedication toward Patrick Cranshaw and Don Knotts. The actor and voice actor who played the supporting character, Sheriff Bob, and his dog Sniffer, respectively. Both passed away between finishing their work on the film and its official release. It's worth noting that this is the only movie in the Air Buddies series that Disney doesn't own the full rights to, due to ownership rights belonging to Air Bud Entertainment. So concludes Air Buddies and so begins Snow Buddies, a 2008 directed DVD movie. Before I go over this, let me just say that this movie has a really dark secret. I was thinking about being a hack and naming the video The Dark History of Snow Buddies, but I ultimately decided to just cover the entire series because I hate myself. Anyway, I'll just keep explaining the summary of these movies for now, but just be ready when I get back around to explaining what this dark secret means in the context of Snow Buddies. Anyway, the plot is Snow Buddies. We get to take a look at how each of the buddies are doing in their new homes. We hear that familiar musical motif from the first film, Welcome Us Back. Early on, it's a pretty normal and typical sequel. Until the buddies stow away in an ice cream truck that gets hauled onto a plane and shipped off to Alaska and then thrown down onto a drop site. I can't believe we're alive. Oh, that's what you think. Back home, the rest of the cast, such as the humans and Airbud and Airbud's wife, try to hunt for the buddies while the buddies rest up in a hole overnight. The next morning, they meet an Alaskan husky named Shasta, while Mudbud has an existential crisis over not being able to get dirty due to all the snow keeping him relatively clean. Shasta helps the buddies by letting them hide out in his home for shelter, and the buddies agree to help him by creating a dog sled team for him with his owner, Adam. Adam is seen praying to our lord and savior God himself, demanding that he delivers him just enough dogs to form his own dog sled team. To contrast Adam's desperate demands for the lord, we then get a depressing montage of all the buddy's owners back home having dour Christmas days, where their dogs have gone simultaneously missing. As Adam gets himself registered for the dog sled races, some older bully huskies decide to tell the buddies that Shasta's parents flat out died a year ago during the races, where some ice broke underneath them, which isn't a great look considering how many dogs died during the making of this- mm, never mind, never mind, ignore that for now. That night, the mythical Alaskan Malamute, Talon, summons Shasta and the buddies to come observe the Northern Lights. He gives Shasta some old sage advice, then leaves forever, except for an off-screen narration at the end of the movie. When the buddies arrive back at their shelter, Rosebud and Buddha can't fall asleep and have an emotional discussion about their seemingly inevitable doom approaching them in the form of a deadly dog sled race. The next morning, the plot finally substantially moves forward as the dog sled races begin. After a brief melodrama over the fact Adam is racing with Golden Retriever puppies, he is fully permitted to race. This seems like it should lead into the climax of the film. But it's got an entire act or so left of really weirdly paced racing movie drama. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that at one point there's a scene where Airbud and his wife, who I finally realized was named Molly, find out where their children went, and during this scene, they arrive in Alaska by stowing away the same way the buddies did. At some point during the race, a horrible blizzard hits and the team rests out in some random person's igloo. After they leave, Adam gets totally wrecked and collapses mid-race and is then... Well, just okay after a while. The gang then arrives at the death site of Shasta's parents, where some villain guy named Gene George's dogs begin to fall into the ice. Gene George, god, say that like five times fast, um, turns into a total man-child and leaves his dogs to die similar to how Robert Vince, director of Snow Buddies, left around 30 dogs to die while directing this <laughs> Wait, it's not time to discuss that yet. 
Um, Adam and Shasta then begin to rescue dogs from the rival team as the buddies watch in anticipation. After rescuing the dogs, Adam, Shasta, and the buddies are victorious as the buddies then proceed to reunite with their parents and fly home to their owners after a brief farewell to Shasta. Buddy and Molly are then seen talking about how their family is incredibly talented. Hooray! Nepotism! And then never appear again for the rest of the series. Nor do most of the humans from the previous series. Making this, in a way, the conclusion to the original Air Buds film career, as well as the final movie integral to the Air Buds series. Some people refer to Alaska as the last frontier, and in some ways, yes, that may be true. How do you take something further than the last frontier? By going to the final frontier. Yes, final is further than last, just trust me on this. For their third outing, the buddies were shot out into space. Space Buddies, released in 2009 as a directed dvd movie, sees the buddies sneak into a sciency building owned by the sci-fi group Vision Enterprises, who seek to more or less commercialize space travel like a certain musky hack we all know in real life. The buddies then stumble into a device that can magically scan and generate spacesuits, and only moments later, they all run onto a spaceship while in clear sight of some very incompetent Vision Enterprises employees. Little do the buddies know, this ship in particular is about to undergo a test launch. After a very dramatic launch sequence, we're treated to a melancholy scene where the owners of the buddies all get home and realize that their puppies have gone missing for the second time. Second to them, that is. Third overall. Meanwhile, the Vision Enterprise's people discover that some idiot forgot to fuel the rocket they just launched out into space. The scientists contact a Russian stereotype named Yuri, who lives on the Russian research space station along with his dog, Spudnik. Yuri agrees to fuel the ship for them, and the scientists send the ship on course to the station. The buddies step out onto the ship and befriend Spudnik, who takes them around the Russian research space station. When Yuri sees the dogs, he is quick to celebrate due to immediately assuming that the buddies will be staying with him. Hijinks ensue as Spudnik randomly reveals the grim truths of the Russian research space station. He hasn't been home in years. The space station is slowly decaying, and Yuri is a lunatic who plans to go down with his ship. When Yuri sees Spudnik literally jumping ship with the buddies, he assumes that Vision Enterprises are merely trying to trick him so that they can kidnap Spudnik. He goes berserk, and after a wild escape sequence, the spaceship literally blows up as everyone narrowly just barely escapes including Yuri, who escapes at just the last second in an escape pod. We then see Spudnik's former owner approaching a memorial statue of him, and wait, just wait. This all started with a movie about a dog playing basketball. <sighs> Spudnik and the buddies then end up on what appears to be what conspiracy theorists believe is the set where the moon landing was allegedly faked. The buddies hop around the CGI moon in slow motion, and due to the odd reality-altering effects of the moon, they phase in and out of CGI forms themselves. Meanwhile, the Vision Enterprises employees finally realize they had stowaways on their ship. Some random ferret pet named Gravity who belongs to someone at Vision Enterprises then tells the buddies to get back onto the ship as the humans freak out about how to get the puppies home and avoid a PR scandal. Nearby, some evil, awful, cynical, corrupted, moronic, selfish, sweaty, unpleasant, Dirty, perverted, off-putting, heinous, sadistic, odious, despicable, disgraceful, nefarious, detestable, iniquitous, cantankerous also ran named Dr. Finkel, an employee of Vision Enterprises who gets off to others' misery, then deliberately puts the buddies on course with the meteor path. The only person who could love this guy is Krella Deville. Word gets out about the buddies being in space as multiple news channels around the world report on the situation. As the ship gets hit by a meteor, Dr. Fingal is seen smiling like the inhumane, awful, horrendous, terrible, monstrous being he is. The buddies send Butterball out to do repairs on the ship. He flings around on his tether and nearly dies, but is ultimately able to... Yeah... Yeah, you, you guessed it. Fart his way back to safety. Eventually, the buddies manage to land safely on Earth after Yuri's escape pod nearly crashes into them. Yuri is somehow okay after this too. The buddies are rewarded with a ceremony where they are referred to as Space Buddies. 
Sputnik returns to his family, etc. It all turns out to be one happy ending. I guess the logical way to carry off of a space movie is a Christmas one. That's always a safe bet. If you've run yourself dry, just cash in on a holiday special. Santa Buddies, somehow released in the same year as Space Buddies, 2009, is a straight-to-DVD flick. Like, both of these movies were made at the same time and crunched out to release in the same year. These movies were somehow popular enough already to make people double dip on Buddy's goodness during the same calendar year. Someone probably spent tons of overtime working on the CGI for these. Actually, um, never mind. Part of this film takes place in the North Pole, presumably making this the second Buddy's movie to take place in Alaska. But the Alaska from the first film isn't really mentioned from what I remember, so I guess the Air Buddy series has two Alaskas. Ah, a world with two Alaskas. Perfect world, really. One for Canada, one for America. This film focuses on the lore of Santa Claus, Santa Paws, and Puppy Paws. Puppy Paws is the son of Santa Paws, the trusty dog of Santa Claus. This little Saint Nick Jr. is a huge scamp, known for being the troublemaker at Santa's workshop. He resents Christmas due to being forced into it as a family business, and gets fixated on the idea of being a regular old dog after seeing some of the buddies causing mayhem via a spy cam that basically shows people who are on the naughty list. The movie begins with the introduction of a magical Christmas icicle, I'm not describing it, that's actually its name, that is melting due to climate ch nobody believing in Christmas. Santa Claus and Santa Claus stand and observe the Christmas icicle and deliver some exposition and explain why it's melting to us. Meanwhile, the buddies are celebrating Christmas back at home and like, the sheriff dog, Deputy Sniffer, whose actor received a dedication in Air Buddies 1, is randomly brought back after two movies of absences. The old sheriff guy, Sheriff Bob, is replaced with the new, young, and campy, Deputy Dan. The buddies are talking with Deputy Sniffer about gifts and naughty lists. And then there's a brief sequence introducing a town dog catcher named Stan Scrooge, a stand-in for the usual Scrooge character in many Christmas films. He nearly catches a small stray dog named Tiny who manages to evade him. This small talking dog then proceeds to... bless the Lord. Thank you Lord for this blessing, amen. I'm pretty sure this might be sacrilege in some way. I should probably mention now that if it wasn't obvious enough that these movies have this very drawing religion thing going on. And keep in mind, because it only gets weirder near the tail end of the series. It's not a bad thing or anything. I'm not one to judge people including bits of their faith in their works. But it's just incredibly strange to see talking dogs prey and, well, you'll see what else they do with it later. Our next scene is with Puppy Paws, standing alone at the Christmas icicle. He basically denounces Christmas, wishing it didn't exist, and it instantaneously makes Santa's workshop go completely kaput. Puppy Paws then runs off to Fernfield to meet the buddies, wandering around town and nearly getting caught by Crooge. He discovers that Fernfield isn't feeling very jolly this year and passes out in a Christmas display in some random shop window. Meanwhile, Santa's reindeer catch what they describe as a deadly, flu-like virus, wow I feel that right about now, and are dying due to the decay of the Christmas icicle. The next morning, Puppy Paws runs into Deputy Sniffer, who sends him toward Butterball's house. He sneaks in the chimney and crushes Butterball, who at first doesn't believe he is really a magical dog from the North Pole, but kinda just rolls with him anyway, agreeing to show him the ropes of being a pup. He takes him to the kitchen as Butterball explains how to be a regular pup, where Puppy Paws showcases his magical powers and gets Butterball in trouble by eating cookies he didn't even touch. Also, this family has a butler. If I didn't already dislike Butterball, this would have sealed the deal. Butterball then introduces Puppy Paws to the other buddies, in which he gets short scenes with each of them, learning their ways. You don't like it? I think it's totally fetch. Quit trying to make that a thing, Rosebud. Wait, did they really just reference Mean Girls? Anyway, Puppy Paws ends up doing, like, everything wrong and, like, defaces Buddha's Buddha statue by turning it into a snowman. It's a snowman. Very zen in the North Pole. So the buddies pretend to play hide and go seek with him and ditch him, then think it's a good idea to blatantly talk about how they hate him so much while still being close by. He overhears and gets abducted by Stan Crooge. Stan Crooge continues to be a real piece of work. A dad approaches him about getting one of the stray dogs he's caught for his kid, but Crooge demands an obscene amount of money. Because he's so sadistic, he gets more enjoyment out of the dogs being cooped up in his cells. Puppy Paws then runs into Tiny, the stray dog from earlier in the movie, who recently got caught. Tiny sings a very strange song that seems like it was improvised by whoever wrote it as a solemn Christmas montage plays. Every night I look up and pray that someone sees the sadness in these lonely eyes 
and shares his love with me. What? We really need a sign. We need to know. Here we go. Puppy Paws now understands the true meaning of Christmas. Back at the North Pole, employees of Santa's workshop discover where Puppy Paws went, and both a human elf named Eli and a dog elf named Eddie are sent to retrieve him. Eddie finds Butterball and joins him to explain to the rest of the buddies that Puppy Paws was never lying. He is actually the descendant of Santa Paws, and is actually from North Pole, and actually has magical powers, actually. Meanwhile, Eli struggles to get his ride back home since it runs on Christmas magic, which is currently at an all-time low. That's right, the Christmas spirit is officially dead. He leaves the vehicle and we get a series of very common Christmas movie jokes where a real elf interacts with fake Christmas stuff, oblivious that it's fake, thus looking like a lunatic to everyone else. Over at Stan Crouch's Pound, the bountiful buddy is Nettie rescue Puppy Paws and release some of the other stray dogs. Eddie sacrifices himself alongside the other stray dogs who all team up to fight him, tickling him to near death. As the buddies escape with puppy paws, it doesn't take long for Stan Cruz to cage up all the dogs again and soon after Eddie breaks multiple cosmic laws and starts actually talking out loud to him. Eddie explains that Stan Cruz is only evil, hates Christmas, and captures dogs because his mom didn't let him have a dog for Christmas when he was a kid. Stan Cruz is taken aback as Eddie phases through the caging and runs off. Puppy Paws then hooks up the buddies to a sleigh as just enough Christmas magic returns to the world. The buddies then start literally flying as Puppy Paws mushes them toward the North Pole. According to Wikipedia, they reference the events of Snow Buddies around this time, but I didn't pick up on that and I didn't want to rewatch the entire movie. Stan Cruz then has a change of heart, which is just enough to revive the Christmas icicle, as Eli continues to talk to a fake elf and tell him about how all the Christmas stuff is totally legit. The Christmas icicle hasn't been repaired quite enough to power Santa's reindeer. So Puppy Paws and the Buddies then finish the job and save Christmas. The Buddies are placed on the nice list, Puppy Paws says his farewells, Stan Crouch has a monologue reflecting on his redemption, and is invited to dinner with Tiny's new home family. Tiny sings an ending reprise of their song from earlier in the movie, etc. My Christmas miracle, my Christmas miracle, this year. Everything is wrapped up in a nice little bow. All in all, it's not like a terrible movie. I'm not entirely immune to cheap, easy, cutesy stuff like this. There's just something so innately comforting about warm-hearted, generic talking dog movies. But this is the same series where the second entry led to the untimely demise of... <laughs> oh, it's not time yet. The movie itself though, cute, weird, but it definitely has some eye-rollingly strange and uncomfortable stuff. But yeah, not the worst movie ever made or anything, but like the other sequels, it's starting to make things even weirder and weirder. So how much weirder can it get? Our fifth movie is The Infamous Spooky Buddies, a 2011 straight-to-DVD movie. Oh my god. Here we're exposed to a dark lore flashback of Warwick the Warlock, preparing to sacrifice the souls of five identical dogs who share blood in order to summon the fabled Halloween Hound? Who can use their power to summon ghosts? <sighs> yep. Okay. Cool. We're also introduced to a talking owl known as Hoot, who can translate dog speak for Warwick. A group of people begin to storm Warwick's manor, and just as they do, the last surviving puppy, a dog named Pip, tries to escape. The storming and escaping attempts fail, as the humans kinda just give up on trying to stop Warwick after witnessing him turn someone into a frog. Pip is then turned to stone, but his soul is prevented from reaching the Halloween Hound. Can't believe this is technically a sequel to a movie based on a dog that could shoot basketball hoops. Pip then becomes an unsettling CGI ghost and is cursed to be trapped within Warwick's Manor as the town condemns the house. 75 years later, we see the buddies and their owners on a town tour being told about the history of the house. Halloween is in the air, and Warwick's old owl, Hoot, is seen lingering around the manor. B-Dog wanders into the manor to prove his machismo, and the other dogs slowly trail in after him. They take notice of the ghost. This is still technically a sequel to a movie based on a dog that could shoot hoops. B-Dog, like any other person in a horror movie, does everything they're not supposed to do. He runs into Pip who asks him not to say Halloween Hound three times, in which he continues to anyway, and thus releases Warwick. Three times! 
He runs off in horror as the dogs then run off to regroup with their kids. There's then a very lengthy scene where the kids finish up their field trip tour and begin discussing school projects that will be due soon. Billy, V-Dog's owner, seemingly has no work done and lies about his project being based on the legend of Warwick. The kids then visit Deputy Dan, who, for whatever reason, happily gives them all sorts of evidence, including Warwick's staff, which Billy ends up using as a part of his last second Halloween costume after he discovers the embarrassing one his mom got him. Halloween night hits as we see more of the wacky kid shenanigans as the buddies group up in their cute little costumes. Elsewhere, two local bullies begin exploring Warwick's manor. They witness Warwick and the Halloween Hound's full awakening. Warwick assumes these two kiddos stole a staff and spellbook, then turns them into rats. They're chased off by a cat as Hoots snitches to Warwick about Billy having a staff. Warwick then goes to steal it back as Pip discovers that he can finally leave the manor. Regular Halloween hijinks then ensue on the streets of Fernfield. Pip freaks out a kid and decides to hide himself under a ghostly sheet to blend in with the local Halloweeners. He then tracks down the buddies to warn them about the Halloween Hound, but as expected, they get freaked out and run off. Meanwhile, the air humans show up at a house that belongs to Joshua, Pip's owner. Joshua recognizes Warwick's staff and panics. Yada yada yada, Warwick runs into the kids, but they manage to narrowly escape, and then Warwick starts enslaving people. The buddies go to some dog named Zelda who knows all about the supernatural. Shortly after meeting her, Pip finally catches up to the buddies again and gets a chance to explain himself. It's revealed that if Pip doesn't make it back to his body by sunrise, his soul will be lost forever. The group agrees to work together to oppose Warwick just as the Halloween Hound catches up to the buddies. Nearby, Warwick terrorizes the town's Halloween party and nearly defeats the kiddos. But Joshua comes to the rescue at the last second. He takes them all to shelter and explains everything he knows about Warwick and his evil plans. You'll be safe here. Evil like Warwick cannot enter the house of God. The buddies escape the Halloween Hound and go to the graveyard. They free Pip of his horrible CGI ghost form and shove him back into his body. The Halloween Hound shows up at the graveyard and turns Zelda to stone. Light. I actually like the darkness. Now get out of my way. <laughs> The buddies are caught, but eventually get released by Hoot after Pip gives him a speech that changes his heart. Not long after, Pip is returned to stone and his soul is used to open the portal to the netherworld. Because of this, evil spirits are unleashed upon all of Fernfield and begin migrating toward Warwick's manor. Also, at one point, Warwick's spellbook is swapped out with the Bible. Upon reading it, he's in pain. It's the Bible! In the kitchen of the manor, Butterball goes and flat out starts eating pickled eyeballs actual, real eyeballs, and he acknowledges this too. The Halloween Hound sneaks up on him, and then Butterball... Uh, Butterball, uh, yeah... Butterball farts against the Halloween Hound, and somehow blows back Halloween Hound's powers and turns, turns him into stone. Butterball farts the Halloween Hound into stone. When he does this, he sounds like he's in horrific pain. Uh, oh. No, <laughs> this can't be happening. I literally cannot even. I can't handle how nasty this scene is. And that moan just makes it so, so much worse. This is more or less the turning point in the movie that leads to the good guys winning. The human kids then reverse Warwick's spell, and Warwick is pushed into hell by Joshua. Warwick's staff is destroyed, and as a result, all of the creatures he turned to stone have their souls set free, and everything returns to normal. Everything is quickly taken care of, and Pip's owner decides to travel around America, bringing all of Pip's siblings back to their rightful homes. After Spooky Buddies came out, Robert Vince decided to test my patience by making the world's most boring, racist, and dull treasure hunting movie of all time. A 2012 direct-to-DVD movie known as Treasure Buddies. Taking a look at the film's logo here, we see that they're very obviously taking some Indiana Jones inspiration, but they didn't take enough inspiration. Every now and then the musical score does go for a very blatant riff on Indiana Jones at least, but that's about it. 
ultimately, even if I were still a kid, this movie would just be a complete disappointing snooze fest. After the supernatural and magical elements in the previous movies took the series to the next level. It's hard to take a step forward after shooting dogs into space or making them defeat an evil demon, but you guys couldn't just cave in and make them battle in giant robots or spaceships? It's a huge step down and is a big disappointment when it comes to the one thing the series excels at, escalation. This movie features a monkey named Bobby and his nephew Babu. Both of them are pretty, uh, well, whoever made this movie probably should have had some consultants. Actually, let me just say it now. This movie is full of rampant stereotypes, even more than the previous movies in the series. It's pretty bad, and is something you'll see a lot of throughout the movie if you watch it. The movie's framing device is Bobby telling Bobby a story about an archaeologist named Thomas Howard, and his dog who is the great uncle of the buddies. Howard and his dog retrieved one half of a dial that is said to lead to Queen Cleocatra's tomb. Cleocatra. He never found the other half though, and like any old boomer, takes the treasure back to stuff it in some museum where it doesn't belong. Turns out Howard is the grandfather of Mudbud's owner, Pete. Also, the buddies are here at the museum talking about cats and a magical amulet that has the power to make people love cats more than dogs, or something. A British archaeologist named Philip Wellington shows up with his cat named Dubasti. Wellington shows Howard that he has the other half the dial, and they start planning to go to Egypt to find the treasure along with Pete. The buddies are supposed to stay behind. But after Ubasti threatens to use the amulet to make humanity favor cats over dogs, they stow away in a... crate full of TNT, and follow Pete and the archaeologist to Egypt. Butterball starts literally eating some explosive substances while trapped in the TNT crate. Yes, I know what you're thinking. It does. Butterball, I take it back. Let her rip. And they eventually break out and encounter Bobby after he steals chicken from Butterball. Bobby ultimately befriends the buddies and helps them hide away at night within some shelter. Meanwhile, Pete has some awkward, uncomfortable subplot where a local girl starts crushing on him. While hiding away at night, the buddies meet a camel named Cammy who was stolen from her mother. The buddies agree to help her find her family, and the next morning they sneak out to follow Pete, Howard, and Wellington. Also, there's an entire scene dedicated to camel poop, where the buddies stop and not only observe it, but discuss it. The group camps out at night as Howard gives Pete a bedtime story about Cleopatra's cat, Cleocatra, explaining that she felt betrayed by Cleocatra and used the powers of her amulet to... make humanity prefer dogs. I just want to say that an often reoccurring story element in Robert Vince's work at Airbud Entertainment is humanity having a large preference of dogs over cats, with cats often being betrayed as evil and or lesser beings, and like, we get it. You have a preference. Not a whole lot of value happens for quite a while, until the buddies encounter Cammy's mother, Mala, and that whole subplot kinda just resolves itself. Meanwhile, Wellington betrays Howard and forces him and Pete to help him do his dirty work. I should've known he was just a grave robber. Oh, come on, Howard! You're like, no better, we saw you rob a grave at the start of the movie. The buddies follow the gang in a hot air balloon, but quickly have to hit the ground and then shelter themselves from a sandstorm. Within the cave is a king cobra named Slither, who challenges the buddies for entrance into Cleocatra's tomb. Buddha and B-Dog then combine their cultural appropriation powers to hypnotize Slither and prove their worth to enter the tomb. Also, Bobby runs off due to chickening out over Slither. Shanti, Shanti. The plot ramps up as the buddies navigate the temple and clear various traps while fighting creepy CGI cat statues. Also, a guy freaking dies in this movie. <laughs> Like this random G-rated movie that's technically a sequel to a flick about a dog playing sports needlessly kills off some dude. Like just gruesomely falls into a pit of snakes while screaming. I can't stress enough how out of nowhere this is. Also, the dude's skeleton appears later in the movie. When they show this room earlier in the movie, there's nothing. But later, after the scene, skeleton. Was this really necessary? Were kids sending in letters complaining that there wasn't enough death in these movies? Like, who is this for? These movies have a body count, both in the actual movies themselves and in their production. When I watched Air Blood 1 as a kid, I actually didn't. I just couldn't help but think about how much I wanted all the characters to die. That totally would have made the movie better for Kid Me. Even better if they're screaming while doing it. Obviously, it's not wrong for a character to die in a kid's movie, especially if they're a bad guy. It's fine. It's, it's stakes. You know, it's treating the audience like they're not 
Like, like it's not being patronizing toward them because they're kids, you know? But there's a time and a place for a dark scene in a kids movie, and then there's this. Just... why? Who... who came up with this? And furthermore, I'm surprised Disney just, just you know, didn't care. Cool! Kill off the random villain, like, henchman in this G-rated flick. It's just so strange. And I just, you know, it's just weird. I can't get over the fact this happens. Out of everything that's happened in these movies up until now, this is the thing that broke me. It wasn't the warlock being shoved into hell, it wasn't the dog being farted into stone, it was this. This broke me. But yeah, Ubasti manages to get a hold of the ancient artifact and scrapes Wellington, who is confused by her betrayal. She starts talking and gloating about her evil plan to banish all dogs, and it's somewhat unclear if the humans can understand her due to the magic powers, but she immediately, suddenly gets turned into a statue, presumably due to a curse of some sort courtesy of Cleopatra, which is kind of anticlimactic. We then see the two old grave robbers sword fight as a chamber opens up to reveal a huge load of treasure. Pete pulls a quick hold on Wellington and knocks him in the head. He doesn't stay down for long and manages to joint the artifact off of Ubasti and tries to escape, only to be caught by a bunch of locals and get arrested. Howard and Pete are declared heroes and everyone goes home with the necklace put on display in the Fernfield Museum, where it doesn't belong. Super Buddies. The Final Air Buddies movie. By extension, the final Air Bud flick released as a direct-to-DVD movie in 2013. We begin the movie with Butterball's owner, Bartleby, who you might remember as the spoiled kid from the first movie. You might not, though. I didn't mention his name up until this point, and I don't blame you if you don't recognize him. It's his birthday. At the start of this movie, Butterball is seen eating Purina brand dog food, which is a fact shoved in the viewer's face. Bartleby is retconned to be highly into superheroes now, Gramps gives him a copy of Kid Courageous and Captain Canine, in which we get a comic book style scene that's, uh, really ugly. To be fair, I have seen comics this ugly before. Bartleby and Butterball gather with the rest of the human kids and buddies outside. It seems like everyone is super into superheroes. And I guess it makes sense, considering this movie came out a year after the first Avengers movie. And this seems like the type of movie that was made in just a year. All of the buddies wander around Bartleby's barn and get involved with kooky antics with the local animals. Afterward, the buddies randomly dig up some magical rings resembling MacGuffins from Bartleby's comic book, known as the Rings of Inspiron. These rings then float up and wrap themselves around the buddies as if they're collars. Bartleby's birthday bash continues as he tells his friends about the origin story of his favorite comic book hero, which leads us to this creepy CGI alien who turns into a dog voiced by the eldest son of Tom Hanks. Not long after the seemingly unrelated comic book hero story, we see the buddies discover their superpowers. Butterball has super strength, B-Dog has this stretching power. Take out the garbage. All right, be right back, dog. Oh, baby, slam a jam a dunk. Buddha can levitate, Mudbud can turn invisible, and Rosebud gets super speed. Meanwhile, wait, the comic book hero origin story is real? And that whole exposition about their backstory from the comic was years ago? Oh, okay. An alien named Commander Drex is flying toward Earth and wants to destroy Captain K-9. Once again, this is technically the 14th installment in the Airbud series. Anyway, Commander Drex has a monkey assistant known as Monkey, who he's not very kind to. The buddies commence to misuse their powers in the worst possible ways. They terrorize the town in the process, steal food, and then go look for someone to rescue. Commander Drex lands on the earth and takes on the form of a pig, putting the ham and green eggs in ham. He hijacks a truck and goes looking for the RINGS OF INSPIRON that the buddies have. Then, for a long, long stretch of time, the superpowered buddies don't appear. Greetings, fellow alien. Good afternoon, sir, and welcome to Galaxy Burger. I need your help getting the RINGS OF INSPIRON. Onion rings? Onion? Why would I want rings from the planet Onion, you bubblehead? Be 
go from scene to scene with Commander Drex running around as a pig, the human kids wandering around, and various adult characters following Commander Drex around. Then, finally, we see the buddies once more as they charge into a burning house to rescue a little girl. Captain Canine shows up to help the buddies rescue her. Meanwhile, the kiddos pick up on the fact that Bartleby's comics are basically real life and see a news report based on the buddies. They head over to go see Deputy Dan, but are too late, as Deputy Dan got body snatched by Commander Drex, who places Deputy Dan in the pig body he previously stole. Deputy Dan, now an animal, is able to communicate with Deputy Sniffer, who helps him escape and warn the buddies. As tensions rise, Captain Canine trains the buddies on how to properly make use of their powers over the course of a training montage. Hello. Ultimately, the climax arrives at a final battle with Commander Drex and Deputy Dan's non-CGI, less expensive human body. The buddies team up to take him down, and Monkey is seemingly a good guy now after briefly bonding with the farm animals a few scenes prior. Bartleby's grandpa then fries Commander Drex with some good old fashioned electricity. At this point, Commander Drex is basically full on discount Jim Carrey. The way he acts, moves, and talks is all what Jim Carrey's character from The Mask or Sonic the Hedgehog. Commander Drex gets legitimately, visibly killed, and explodes in his spaceship after being tricked into taking fake copies of the RINGS OF INSPIRON! Everyone celebrates the death of Commander Drex as adult Kid Courageous, who I feel inclined to mention is played by Jason Earls, otherwise known as the voice of Sputnik from Space Buddies, or Jackson Stewart from Hannah Montana, finds the dead body of Captain K-9, as he apparently died during the battle. Captain K-9 is then given the kiss of life thanks to the power of the RINGS OF INSPIRON! Which probably would have benefited the cast and crew of Snow Buddies, oh, it's almost time to talk about that, and then Captain K-9 is revived. A weird princess alien whose visual aesthetic is similar to that of the Dark Crystal then descends to the Earth. Captain K9 then reverts into his original form, Captain Megasus, and returns to his planet along with the princess and a fully redeemed Monk E. Then the ending of E.T. happens, everyone looks up at the spaceship as it leaves, and the movie concludes with the Super Buddies getting a comic book deal, ending the series by confirming that the Buddies keep their powers and become the new protectors in this ever-changing, terrifying, and purely chaotic cinematic universe in which dogs are known to often partake in sports. Alright, so now every single one of us knows the full plot outline of the Air Buddies saga. Now we can finally look into its production. So why did they make so many of these? Were they really popular enough to justify releasing two movies within one year back in 2009? Let's take a look back where it all started. The first Airbud. The first Airbud movie released in theaters in 1997 and was based on a real life dog known as Buddy, a stray taken in and raised by Kevin DeChico. Buddy was trained to play all sorts of sports, and the first movie based on him grossed around 27 million on a 3 million budget. It apparently did pretty well in home video sales too. Which led to another theatrical film in 1999 called Airbud, Golden Receiver. A fun, or I guess, stressful fact is that Golden Receiver was made without the authorization of the real-life Buddy's owner, and that it had some interesting backstage drama. Kevin DeChico claimed he never got any financial compensation for the first film, and that he intended to make his own sequel called Airbud, The Next Generation, which I assume would have focused on the three children of the real-life Buddy who were also trained to play sports. Not sure what happened there. But Golden Receiver ultimately released in theaters only to gross 10 million on a budget of 11 million. Yikes. Somehow, the series continued with a third directed video movie a mere year later in 2000, known as Airbud World Pup. It must have sold well, because two years later we saw Airbud, seventh inning fetch, released in 2002 as another directed video film. The series seemingly reached its natural conclusion with Airbud, spikes back in 2003, another directed video film. Three years later, Air Buddies was released direct to DVD in 2006, acting as a sort of soft reboot in some ways. It had a lot in its favor, being a fresh new start, being a spin-off featuring cute and marketable babies, and extensive marketing. Having the longest gap between Airbud films also probably helped it just a tiny bit. According to TheNumbers.com, the site I'll be using to research the sales numbers of each movie, Air Buddies likely made around 40 million total in revenue. Wow. It's a little hard to find marketing material online now, but TV commercials and promotions were all over the place for the buddies on Disney Channel, all the way up until its release. Tons of children watching Disney Channel were likely to have seen commercials or trailers for the film and requested the movie, which released in early mid-December, meaning it most definitely got a massive Christmas boost in sales. 
In 2008, Snow Buddies released as the first sequel during the month of February. It's estimated to have made 50 million in total sales. And it's important to note that these are mainly within months of release, so that's not even counting later reprints, reissues, etc. A completely opposite turnaround from the original Airbud and its sequel, which trended downward in profits. It makes sense as to why they would want to rush into making two more movies now. These next two movies were Space Buddies and Santa Buddies, both releasing in 2009. Space Buddies was another February release, and was estimated to have made 32 million. Santa Buddies acted early, and rather than releasing in December like you would most likely expect of a Christmas flick, it hit the shelves in November to give itself a little head start. Between the DVD and Blu-ray, it seems as if the Christmas boost gave it a huge push, similar to that of the first film, as it's estimated to have made 50 million. Really just non-stop profits here. Over the next three years, Spooky Buddies released in 2011, Treasure Buddies in 2012, and Super Buddies in 2013. Spooky Buddies released in September, and seems to have made nearly 20 million, but fell a little short, which is a pretty big step down from the previous films. Treasure Buddies released in January, only a few months after Spooky Buddies. It managed to break over 20 million. Lastly, Super Buddies was an August release. It made a relatively disappointing 11 million. Hey, at least it made back the budget of Golden Receiver. It probably made back its own cheap direct video budget too, but it's also one of the most CGI-heavy films in the series. So, I imagine the profits probably weren't stunning to anyone involved. Millions upon millions in DVD and Blu-ray sales is nothing to scoff at. Heck, let's not forget that the Air Buddies also spawned its own spin-off. A spin-off of a spin-off. The Santa Paws Duology. The Search for Santa Paws released direct-to-video in 2010 and made an excellent 42 million. While its sequel, Santa Paws 2, The Santa Pups, released in 2012 as a direct-to-video movie and made a significantly less 15 million. The Air Buds series, thanks to the Air Buddies movies, makes up one of the highest grossing direct-to-video franchises of all time. By March 2014, the first 12 movies had made at least 220 million. Heck, that's even more revenue than over 20 Barbie movies had at that exact same time. The series very much fizzled out near the end there, with Spooky Buddies and Treasure Buddies only making half the previous flicks, and Super Buddies making a mere half of those. I'm not sure what a lot of the rest of the straight-to-video market is like, but I think a lot of cheaper knockoff films with cheap budgets would probably love to make that 11 million that Super Buddies had made, but don't quote me on that. If I had to guess, the oversaturation of the Buddies probably wore a bit thin. When you're out there releasing two movies in one year, people are bound to get tired of that eventually. Well, at least in most cases. Perhaps the later movies failed to capture the interest of new fans, as all the children who were previously attached started to outgrow the series. I'm a little surprised they haven't tried to cash in a bit on the buddies ever since Super Buddies was released. Not even a nostalgia reboot on Disney+. Plus. Despite how things ended, the Air Buddies were still a powerhouse franchise. It really just goes to show that if you're milking something completely dry like Air Bud, it's time to baby it up for a second lease on life with something like Air Buddies. So now we know why these films are all made. But let's talk about how they got made. I can finally, finally reveal the dark, dark secret of Snow Buddies. Before I get on to that promised dark secret, I'm going to discuss various production tidbits and weird aspects about the series at its core. Like with most movies of the talking dog nature, this film used various trained dogs. It seems a lot of the training was done on set. The puppies they used were as young as possible, as puppies do grow old pretty dang fast. According to various interviews, they would have doubles for every dog, as some pups were more capable of performing certain commands or tricks than others. The expressions of the voice actors for all the talking animals would be recorded via camera while voicing their lines. These would be used for reference when animating the mouse of each animal. Animals would be photographed and recorded from various different angles to help construct and texture 3D models of their faces which would be added over their entire actual head in digital production. In Airbud World Pup, Buddy and Molly already had various different puppies named Zack, Duke, Shooter, and Striker. These dogs grew into full adults in Airbud, 7th inning fetch, and are seemingly retconned out of existence in Airbuddies, in favor of starting anew with the more marketable Airbuddies. The Airbud Wiki describes this as if the Airbuddies themselves are forever immortal beings, that took the place of the original children in a sort of existentially terrifying, malevolent way. Oh, and speaking of Molly, her owner changed. In the Air Bud series, her owner was a teenage girl named Emma, while in the Air Buddies movies, Molly's owner is now a young boy named Henry. 
And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. But wait, let me just preface this by saying that if you don't react very well to hearing about animal cruelty and death, please skip this segment of the video via the timestamp down below in the description. I will give 8 seconds for you to do so. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, so Snow Buddies. The cutesy talking animal movie that made $50 million is one of the few commercial talking dog movies I can think of that could not include the No Animals Were Harmed disclaimer. It received an unacceptable marking from the American Humane Association. Eight dogs died during the making of this movie. There were 50 other dogs used during production, and even they fell ill to various viruses, though survived. The production of this movie was a nightmarish, hellacious travesty, and I cannot imagine what it must have been like for any children on set. The movie started with just 30 puppies. Already on the first day of filming, 15 of these puppies were being seen by a vet, diagnosed with Giardia and Cocodia. Three of these 15 dogs had to be euthanized. Not long after, it was discovered that the puppies were 8 weeks old, meaning that they were likely 6 weeks old when they first arrived on set. USDA rules at the time stated that it was illegal to transport puppies under the age of 8 weeks. Because of this, the remaining 27 puppies had to be removed from the set. 28 new puppies were brought in their place, and all 28 of them were exposed to parvovirus. 6 of them becoming extremely ill and an additional 5 of them dying. This movie had death, trauma, and crime going on all at once during its production. Yet we still got all these quirky blooper reels and making of videos based on the movie. Listen to Robert Vince in this making of video. This is Robert Vince, the director of Snow Buddies. One of the biggest challenges in making this film was attempting to recreate the cold Alaska winter in Vancouver, British Columbia. He sounds like a broken man full of guilt, knowing deep down he played a part in the loss of many young, cuddly, innocent, harmless canine friends. They're out here making goofy, feel-good funnies and behind-the-scenes videos in the most tone-deaf way. Read the room, Robert. You want behind-the-scenes? Then why don't you talk about the dogs that perished making this thing? It gets even worse when you realize that the death of Shasta's parents is a major plot point later in the movie. Gene George, the villain of the movie, tries to leave his dogs to die in a very careless and selfish way, and I just... Hey. People working on this movie. Do you feel that irony? Isn't it just crawling up your spine? Like, literally at all? I would feel genuinely bad and a little understanding if it were truly a freak accident, but these people actually took a bunch of underage puppies and illegally transported them somewhere extremely cold. It's not a coinky dink that nearly every animal used in the filming of this movie ended up catching some kind of virus. There are most definitely people to blame in this situation, and somehow, despite all of this, they just moved along their merry way and released this cutesy kid movie and raked in a 50 million profit after everything. This is the second movie in the series, too. Disney quite literally said, Hey guys, it's okay about 8 dead dogs and 50 ill ones. You made us 50 million, so you can make 5 more movies! If I had any authority over these guys, I would have decided not to hire them for further projects the moment the first three dogs were euthanized, and then outright fired them once the additional five died. That's all I can really say on the production of these things. Outside of Snow Buddy's controversial production, there is no whole lot of information on the production of each movie. There are behind the scenes bonus featurettes on the DVDs, but they just delve into the usual surface level aspects of movie making, such as the use of green screen or special effects. I've tried reaching out to staff and cast members I could get in contact with to learn more about these movies, but I never got anything back. But for now, all we really have to work with is the various DVD bonus features, and seeing as how much baggage Snowbody's hid, I don't know how much I trust the other behind-the-scenes featurettes for these movies. It seems as if the Airbuddy series, despite being wildly popular for about half a decade, spawned a very small amount of merchandise. I know, I'm as shocked as you are. I figured there would at least be small collectible figurines, in fact, I'm surprised they didn't backtrack and make Funko Pops of all the buddies sometime within the past few years. The merchandise the series did spawn included many plush toys that were made to promote various buddies' films. Likewise, there were plush toys produced for the Santa Paws duology as well. 
It seems these plushies were primarily distributed via the Disney Store and tie-in promotions with the DVDs. Meaning that to acquire them, you had to go a little out of your way to do so. You can still find them on eBay, but they've gotten a little up there in price. I guess that means there's still demand for buddies after all. Um, other than that though, the only other thing I could find in terms of merchandise was tie-in books, including junior novelizations of pretty much every movie and some short-looking spin-off picture books. I almost bought them and went through them just for the sake of this video, but I didn't feel like going that far, so I didn't. It seems there was also some sort of Kellogg's promotion to get free Halloween candy bags. Oh, and because Santa Buddies was a Christmas special, it got a soundtrack release. For a series that generated nearly 220 million in revenue purely due to direct to video movies alone, there is a stunning lack of official merchandise. I could see that being another part of the reason why the series kind of fizzled out in sales, besides the whole milking it to death while the audience grew out of it thing. In this day and age, merchandise can sadly be vital in keeping something in the public eye, and thus keeping it financially worth investing in. By creating all sorts of merchandise for your IP, you urge people to acquire things related to something they passionately enjoy, that they then take into their home, in which it serves as a little reminder of the love they hold for the IP. That essentially makes it an advertisement. Action figures, posters, plushies, stickers, and memorabilia in general can basically be described as advertisements. When you have guests over, regardless if you're a kid or an adult, they'll take notice of what you have around your house. A young kid visiting their friend's house will be sure to notice all the toys and likely discover all sorts of cool characters that they want to learn more about. An adult visiting their friend's house might see some fancy box sets of their favorite TV series, a framed poster of one of their favorite movies, collector's statues, the whole works. These can tend to be a pretty natural conversation starter and in general serves as a way to make something that was previously unknown to someone something that they now know about. By creating an actual physical reflection of something, you're immortalizing it. Junior novelizations? School libraries might pick up cheap copies which students will then read. T-shirts? Literally advertising something to everyone you walk by, which is a big part of the reason why so much merchandise is just lazily slapping a logo onto something and calling it a day. Toys and action figures? They'll likely get handed down to a child's sibling, thus getting them interested in the series. That or they could end up at second-hand shops or get donated. Stickers? Whether you slap it on the back of your car you drive through the city, your notebook you take to all your classes, or your water bottle you carry with you to the gym, it's the same thing. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing or that any of us are becoming hopeless victims of consumerism just because we enjoy owning a plush of a character we like, or buy a sticker sheet to decorate some of our favorite things by putting imagery from something we enjoy on it. It naturally sparks joy in us. And merchandising doesn't really become a problem until the companies producing said merchandise try shoving a product into every single waking corner of your life. Or they get exploitive with artificial scarcity tactics. Or the opposite, overproduced cheap plastic things that not enough people actually want while harming the environment. There's a middle ground to be had in providing people with merchandise that not only makes them happy but spreads brand awareness. Though it's pretty easy to mess up and create damaging, exploitive, and cheap merchandise instead. The Buddies series somehow failed to merchandise itself while also exploiting people by pressuring children into begging their parents to buy each movie in a specific way with a specific coupon of some sort, just to acquire exclusive plushies they couldn't get anywhere else. While they did create products that, in a way, physically immortalized the characters thanks to plushies and junior novelizations, most of it was hard to obtain, and they did very little to put the series in the actual public eye. Had they been a bit smarter about merchandising the series, the original audience outgrowing the films likely wouldn't have been an issue. If a family had buddies content in their house thanks to an older sibling who eventually grew out of the buddies, then a younger sibling could quickly fill in their place and keep the buddies train rolling. This sort of thing is part of why Cars and Toy Story can get sequels years later and still be just as successful. Kids know who the characters are because it's impossible not to know them. If they have older siblings, they've probably received hand-me-down merchandise. And if not, then they've definitely seen the characters in public somewhere. The parents will recognize the brand too, either remembering that they could rely on the brand to entertain their previous children, or perhaps even recognize the brand as a nostalgic and comforting presence from their own childhood, thus introducing it to their child. I think it's very interesting that despite how cheap the series was to make and how massively lucrative it was, the company known for making spin-offs of spin-offs and commodifying milk with blue food coloring in it made little to no effort to keep this source of income afloat. The saga as a whole is a masterclass in selling out without even leaving an actual mark. If you watched the entire video up until this very point and somehow don't think that these Airbud movies are extremely weird, then, well, I think you're weird. 
And also, I want some of what you're having. Would I call the Buddy Saga flat out bad? Or rather, are all these movies irredeemable trash? Well, they're not exactly the worst thing ever made. They're mostly just confusingly weird. Starting with a regular talking dog movie about some puppies saving their parents, and ending things with said puppies all turning into beloved cosmic superheroes who protect the Earth is just weird. It gets even weirder when you realize that it didn't actually start with the aforementioned talking dog movie, but this, Air Bud, a movie about a dog that didn't talk, that plays basketball, based on a real-life dog who is seen in various daytime TV shows. The tone issues and escalation this series has is perhaps what it's most known for. The movies themselves aren't inherently awful. Overall, they manage to do what they set out to do by just being movies entertaining for children. Their oddities make them actually kind of fun to watch. Obviously, nobody is going to sit down and watch these expecting them to be highly cinematic experiences. But they still manage to be kind of memorable purely by being so weird it's impossible not to remember them. I would call them harmless and endearing children's movies, but with the frequent stereotypes and questionable stuff, consistently weird strange religious undertones, and the literal crimes committed behind the scenes, and the deaths of multiple living beings, that's not exactly what I would call completely harmless. And all of these elements do drag them down. I would honestly probably take active steps towards not letting any potential kids I might have someday not discovering these movies. I would rather they watch something higher quality where dogs didn't die during production. I think that all jokes aside, it's best that the series fizzled out into a whole bunch of nothing. Part of me would have loved to see how they could further escalate this ridiculous series after the high stakes of Super Buddies. Maybe a disaster movie where the world ends. Or Pacific Rim style movie where the buddies have to use their superpowers to fight a kaiju? Maybe even War Buddies. Or a sequel to Space Buddies called Galaxy Buddies. I'm honestly shocked they didn't ever make Time Buddies, where the buddies travel through time and reference all the previous adventures. All jokes aside, however, you don't deserve to make five more wacky movies if you messed up as badly as you did while making the second movie. The series should have been stopped in its tracks at Snow Buddies. I get it, accidents happen, and I'm not saying that you can't make more movies ever again afterward. But, like, maybe just scrap the Buddy series, or at least cancel Snow Buddies? And try to make a new, deathless production instead of releasing the movie where a bunch of dogs died and the rest got ill literally on the first day of filming and then market it toward kids. Just a thought. I'm honestly surprised they haven't tried to cash in on something Airbud related via Disney Plus yet. Honestly, it's gonna happen at some point. I guess we'll just have to wait and see if an eventual revival is something Airbud proper or a nostalgia revival continuing to focus on the buddies. It would be pretty funny if they just announced a new one and thought out called it Air Buddies 2, A New Beginning. I still can't believe I've seen every movie in this series twice, let alone once. Originally, I was going to make this video like a year ago, but I held off on it for a pretty long time. I just think Air Bud Entertainment in general just mesmerizes me. They've been making movies and TV content ever since the late 1990s, all the way to this very day. All of them featuring animals, usually talking ones at that. I did ironically watch Pup Academy on Netflix, and honestly, I thought it was actually pretty high quality compared to the Buddies films. And I think it's an all-around pretty decent cute TV show. I would recommend it to anyone who has kids, anyone who really likes dogs, or anyone who just needs some kind of pick-me-up where they can shut their brain off. That said, over the next couple years, I plan on releasing more videos going over the entire filmography of Airbud Entertainment, such as a video covering the two Santa Paws films this December, a video going over the most vital primate series, along with other monkey-related Airbud Entertainment films, and hopefully, by the end of the summer, a video going over all five Airbud films.